Okay, great. <clears throat> so I'm going to be introducing uh, my colleague Sue and her PhD student Amanda. So uh, Sue McKenna is the Director of Postgraduate Studies at Rhodes University in South Africa, where she runs a number of support initiatives for supervisors and scholars. <clears throat> and she also runs a large PhD program in higher education studies with research focusing on teaching and learning, um, national qualification frameworks, development of institutional policy, um, and then et cetera, a whole bunch of interesting topics. And Amanda is a lecturer in business management at the University of Johannesburg and researching plagiarism for her PhD in higher education studies uh, through Rhodes uh, University. So I'm going to hand over to um, Sue and Amanda. And folks, if you have any questions, feel free to type in the text chat and then I'll collect them um, and sort of uh, bounce them back to Sue and Amanda, but later on. Okay, over to you guys. Great. Thanks so much, Nicola. Um, yeah, so what we're going to do is Amanda's going to start by telling you um, a bit about her PhD study, um, and then I'll come in after she's done that. Um, I know I'm a bit biased as Amanda's supervisor, but it really is a fantastic study. And she's looked at the issue of plagiarism broadly. And importantly, it's, it's a study across the whole South African sector. So she really is, um, she's already published quite a bit from her PhD. And her PhD looks at far more than just the use of Turnitin, which is what we're focusing on today. It really looks at the whole way in which we conceptualize knowledge creation in the academy and the way in which we perhaps misunderstand the role of referencing. And, and focus on plagiarism instead of focusing on knowledge construction. So that's a bit of background about um, Amanda's PhD. And, um, and, and you'll see at the end of the slideshow, there are some references to her, her publications so far. Um, but let me hand over to Amanda and she can tell us a bit about the aspects of her study that focused on Turnitin. Amanda, I'm gonna give you control of the mouse so that hopefully you can change um, slides. Over to you. I don't think your mic is on, Amanda. Can't hear you. Okay. There we go. Finally. Thank you, Sue, and good afternoon, everyone, from the hot Joburg, South Africa. Um, as Sue said, the presentation today is based on my PhD study, which is on how plagiarism is understood in higher education across South Africa. Okay. I'm not sure if I, I have the, the control, Sue. Thank you. Okay, in literature, we, we learn that plagiarism has got more to do with the, the era that we are living in, whereby we've got rapid growth of technology. And these technologies are affecting how knowledge is produced and how knowledge is disseminated. So because of this now, we cannot treat knowledge production traditionally. So as institutions of higher learning, we have to come up with new models of handling knowledge. So the very same technologies, they, they have an impact on how plagiarism is, is understood. They have a dual impact where they can, they, they, they present opportunities in terms of availing knowledge or availing information abundantly, and as well as making information sharing very easy. But at the same time, they are posing some challenges in terms of digital plagiarism. 
So as I said, these, these technologies present opportunities. Some scholars attested that they are very much useful when it comes to detecting other forms of plagiarism, such as collusion, especially in instances whereby students are given the same topic in a group to discuss and write up individual assignments. So these te technologies can help. But again, as much as they are helpful, there are some pitfalls that are associated with the technologies, especially the text matching technologies such as Tenet in and others. So some of the pitfalls are that they, they present some false positives. In other words, they, they over-report plagiarism. This has been tested by authors such as Weber Wolf, where they, they, whereby they, they, they compared quite a number of text matching softwares. And not only that, but sometimes they miss incidents of plagiarism. They present uh, uh, false negatives. They miss some incidents of plagiarism, more so because these technologies only match text that is digitalized. So other text that is not digitalized cannot be accessed. And one other thing is that because some of these uh, technologies, they, they store uh, people's assignments and work in some repository, the scammers take advantage of that to use those papers in paper mills. So as I've said, this study is based on my PhD and quite a number of other publications that we have co-published with, with Sue, looking at how text matching software under, is understood across South African higher education. The data that was used came from institutional policies, different institutional policies, including plagiarism policies from South African universities, as well as interviews with members of committees managing plagiarism across South Africa. So data has shown that most universities use text matching software to manage plagiarism. And that again, turn it in is mostly used as a text matching tool in this institution. And not only that, but it, in data, there was no way where other, any other tool was mentioned except turn it in. So it was the only text matching tool that was institutionalized in different universities. But text that they, they, they use and what text matching technologies can do was found to be misunderstood in these institutions. For example, the four universities below, as you can see, they, they mentioned that they've institutionalized this and they regard this uh, software as a plagiarism detection software. The first one, the first statement is taken from one university which says, the postgraduate student must make use of electronic plagiarism detection software, e.g. turn it in, before they submit their treaties, dissertations, thesis, or assessment, and so forth. So the other three also, they, they've instituted uh, turn it in, and they refer to it as a, a plagiarism detection software. These kind of statements, they show that Turn it in is almost always misunderstood as a plagiarism detection tool. And this misunderstanding doesn't only happen amongst ac academics, but it was also found in literature that it is re referred to as a plagiarism detection tool. You can refer to these uh, authors down here. And having such an understanding of text matching tool or turn it in, it means that 
now they, they use it as a, as a policing tool, which has got some dire repercussions. For example, some universities use a similarity score to determine the penalties for plagiarism. If you look in this university, they use a, a minor case is described as less than 10%. A moderate case is... A, okay, I think my, my screen is not showing everything here. Some text has been obscured but I'll be there from my notes. The moderate, a moderate case is more than 10%, but less than 20% of text lifted, and a serious offense is more than 20% of text lifted. And on top of that, when students are submitting their assignments, they are required to submit the, the first page of the tenant in report as a cover page. So this cover page is only one page, whereas the, the, the originality report is a massive document. And from that cover page, you can only have a, a similarity score index. So they use that similarity score index to determine whether the student has plagiarized or not. Whereas the, the whole report, which the assessor is supposed to scrutinize to see if really plagiarism will happen is left behind. So stipulating such, you know, or using a percentage only to judge whether plagiarism happened or not, suggests to students that there is a certain acceptable level of plagiarism. Of which is a misconception. And again, students are encouraged to use TenetIn to reduce plagiarism. For instance, this participant says, I give them two opportunities to submit so they can see what the initial similarity report is and they can adjust it from there. So because of this, students learn very quickly how to manipulate the system so that they, they can be able to get an acceptable similarity index score. For instance, as the participants say, they put their projects through turn it in, but they know how to manipulate it. And we actually had incidents where we had to call students in where they have changed their parameters, which ultimately changed the turn it in report. So this misplaces the role of paraphrasing and referencing. So when the student paraphrase, they think they're paraphrasing to satisfy the system, which is not correct. And this very same technology, it, it, it teaches them to, to become, can I say better cheats, because they, 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 they manipulate it in such a way that at the end of, of, of the day, they get away with, with what they're doing. They get away with plagiarism. And also, they, it misplaces, the, the practices misplaces the, the role of referencing. Now, referencing is, as, is, is, is now understood as a technical process for avoiding plagiarism, rather than learning how different disciplines draw from knowledge sources to make credible claims. Understanding turn it in in such a way, together with other text matching technology, it deprives students from engaging in proper knowledge construction practices. So that's my conclusion. I would hand over to Sue to speak on the, the next slide. Thank you. Great, thanks, Amanda. Yeah, so let me speak um, on this slide. Uh, let me try and get rid of these other things that I've got on my screen. So, oh dear, 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 hang on. Give us a minute, guys, and I'll get back to you. Somehow the entire PowerPoint has just decided to shut. 
uh, oh, there was a problem with PowerPoint. Well, wouldn't you know? Of course there was. So as while I'm opening PowerPoint again, as Amanda was um, indicating, there was this real misunderstanding to the extent that it was even in a lot of policy documents that, um, that students were expected to, um, let me go back, sorry guys. Please just be patient, share, share PowerPoint. Yes, um, hopefully that means it's now sharing that um, students were expected to um, use Turnitin and just submit the cover sheet with their assignments. And somehow the academics thought that that was reducing plagiarism, whereas in actual fact, what that was doing was greatly increasing plagiarism. Now, Turnitin itself, hopefully you can all now see this um, slide. This is a blog on the Turnitin site. And you'll see that Turnitin itself indicates that it is not a plagiarism detection software. It is a uh, text matching software and that's a crucial difference because of course you can plagiarize through paraphrasing and that's what these students are learning that they meant to do through the use of Turnitin. You've got to get below a certain percentage so you must make sure that you hide your plagiarism by paraphrasing sufficiently which is one of the reasons why first language speakers of English are far less likely to be caught in inverted commas to be caught um, plagiarizing through turn it with, with something like turn it in because we, we don't yet have the artificial intelligence to search for matched ideas it can only search for ma matched texts and turn it in itself makes clear that it's not plagiarism software it says Turnitin does not detect plagiarism per se, it just finds texts. And it goes on to say it is up to a human being to determine whether those text matches are a problem or not. And as Amanda said, in most cases, we found that there was no human being involved in making that assessment because the students simply had to submit the cover sheet um, with their assignment. Um, and I know as an examiner of masters and PhDs, um, I've actually received the cover sheet from some universities with thesis to examine it, which is hugely problematic. Um, and and, and um, I should say that this is also common practice in the Middle East. So here's an example of a text that was found to be 85% um, similarity on the similarity index. But of course, it's 0% plagiarism, because if you tick the box that um, um, excludes direct quotes, it'll come all the way down to 2%. So what we have here is an example where if the student has set up the um, Turnitin report to exclude direct quotes, there's only 2% text matched. But actually, this was a perfect opportunity to show the student that it's really poor writing, because what the student has done, and I've highlighted the, the direct quotes, is the student has done what typical novice um, researchers do. They're just summarizing and cobbling together um, other people's views, other people's texts. And so here's an example where Turnitin could actually be a really useful resource to talk to students about things like voice and about making claims. Um, and not relying too heavily on direct quotes. Um, so really what we're saying is that 5% might be completely unacceptable plagiarism. 25% can be no plagiarism at all. In fact, in the previous example, 85% was no plagiarism at all. It was poor writing, but it wasn't plagiarism. So using this percentage as any kind of indicator is really, really problematic. Now, I've actually can tested, contended, uh, I think contended is the word, I've actually contended that, that Turnitin make very clear that the, the percentage has no correlation to plagiarism, but they only do that after about five clicks through on their website. Nowhere do they claim that they are plagiarism software, but they also avoid stating directly that that percentage means nothing in terms of the degree of plagiarism, because they know that they make a heck of a lot of money around the world based on that um, misapprehension that the percentage means them. And then, of course, in certain disciplines, and law is a classic example, in fact, becoming academically literate in that discipline means taking on certain formulaic conventions 
And so a similarity index is very unhelpful for those kind of disciplines, unless you once again look through the report very carefully. And so a statement back in consideration of the foregoing and respective representations, blah, 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 um, Turnitin is going to pick that up as being copied text, but it isn't. It's simply the student actually taking on the expected terms and phrases from the discipline. Um, so I'm going to use Amanda's own PhD as an example before um, sort of end off and open up for, for discussion. Um, Amanda's own PhD, uh, we put that through Turnitin and it came up with a 7% similarity index. Now some institutions say anything less than 10% is fine, others say anything less than 5% is, is fine. Of course, we know 7% means nothing at all. In fact, what it tells you is, is the extent to which she has used um, other people's voices perhaps, or that she's used direct quotes. Um, but this 7%, by the way, was after we'd taken out all direct quotes. So initially it was 14%. Then we, we clicked the box that said, delete, you know, don't look at anything between inverted commas. And then it brought it down to 7%. And as, as we've said repeatedly, um, of course, 7% means nothing unless you look at the whole report. Now, turn it in, in its report, it gives you a list of sources, and I have a problem with that word because it's not sources. Sources are things that you've actually looked at and used. What they really mean is sources that have similarity to what you've said. It doesn't mean that you actually have used that text. But Amanda 7%, not, not one of the over 100 um, texts that turned it in um, indicated had similar words to words that she'd used in the PhD. Not one of them had more than 1% similarity. So I'm going to take one example of a text that had 1%, which was the maximum, um, and I want to just show you how if you don't read through the report, you don't understand what Turnitin does. But this particular source, it said that this that the source had one percent similar words, or or Mandis, um, thesis said one percent similar words to the source, and it said that in six places in her thesis, there were phrases that she'd used that had come from that source. So let's have a quick look at those. The first one: Center for Higher Education Research, Teaching and Learning, and the word and and the word in that. So that block on the left-hand side comes from the title page of Amanda's thesis, and it says, aha, those words have been used by this source, which is a book published by Sun Media, by the way. And surprise, surprise, it's the name of the center. I presume those words are used all over the place. The second um, example that it came from, supposedly come from the same source, had the words conclusion, chapter, research methodology, introduction, and research. The third piece of text that supposedly came from source 13 was this phrase, on preparing graduates for the world of work. I suspect that other people have used that particular phrase around the world. The fourth example of text in Amanda's thesis, which supposedly came from a book published by Sun Media, includes the words, the way in which knowledge is produced and the fourth is a reference from Gooding Brown, and it says social and cultural practices, Gooding Brown, 2000, page 36. But if you look at how she's used it, Gooding Brown calls for a disruption of such ideas through a critical dismantling of the concept of structures which inform social and cultural practices. And the book from which she supposedly took these terms said, to the desire and attempt to uncover the assumptions or rules which inform the firmament of social and cultural practices. So a completely different use of that phrase. And then the final one was that she supposedly plagiarized, if you understand similarity to mean plagiarism, which we do not, but many do. She supposedly plagiarized the words, it is important to note that, the report. So I think there's a classic example of the futility of using of calling for a percentage on the Turnitin report. As I said, this is very common in a number of um, universities in South Africa, a number of African countries, and in a number of countries in the Middle East, where even at national level, we are seeing for such things. But calling for a percentage on a Turnitin report, thinking that the similarity percentage has any relationship to the degree of plagiarism, and looking only at the cover sheet of the Turnitin report without the analysis of the full report encourages students to plagiarize. 
So it's our contention that very sadly, um, the misuse of Turnitin doesn't address problems of plagiarism. It certainly doesn't give students access to understanding how knowledge is made and how that relates to the use of prior texts. And it has the very unfortunate effect of helping students to plagiarize better. So there you have um, the um, references of various publications and, um, and hopefully soon I'll be able to send the final version of the PhD through too. And I think that's it. So um, we're hoping now to have a discussion around uh, questions or, or comments. Tony's written, Turnitin does not claim to detect plagiarism, but profits from a fear of plagiarism in the university sector. Absolutely. Thank you, Sue and Amanda. Um, so I have a good, yeah, Tony asked a question. He said, sure, so should we scrap Turnitin and save our universities a whole lot of money? And I think there are some of our colleagues in the room who are probably having similar thoughts. So what do you think? Well, I'll dive in and Amanda, you can add on. Um, I, I don't think so because I think Turnitin is a fantastic learning tool, but it really then needs to be used not for assessing plagiarism at the point of, of, of um, submission of an assignment. It should be used in the classroom. So it really is incredibly useful to help students to de develop voice. It really is. Um, but that, that involves, you know, sitting with students with their Turnitin report and showing them where they are reliant on um, text too much. And it can also be useful for plagiarism. In the event where plagiarism is found, it can help to ascertain exactly where that plagiarism has happened. But, um, but I'm just I'm very cautious of, of its use in that regard. And it might be interesting to know that a number of universities in America have stopped using it because they've had court cases, they've had litigation around its use. Um, interestingly, only one or two of, the, of those um, court cases have been where students have been punished for plagiarism and then were able to show that it was misreading or non-reading of the Turnitin report. So there were a couple of cases and, and it being America, a litigious society, um, a couple of students sued their universities for that. But more commonly, there've been far more cases in the States where um, students have sued um, their universities for using Turnitin because of the copyright um, implications because just Turnitin is constantly building its database for comparison of submissions to other documents. So it has a database of every single journal article and every website and what have you, but it also adds to its database every assignment submitted by every student around the world. Um, and these students sued their universities saying that the university didn't have a right to hand over their assignments to a third party and they won their cases. And so a number of prestigious Georgetown, Harvard, Yale, they don't, um, they don't prevent people from using Turnitin, but they no longer um, pay for Turnitin themselves. Okay. So I, I agree with Sue that we don't necessarily have to stop using it, but we need to teach our academics how to use it. I, I personally use it as well, and it's very much useful in terms of, of helping students to, to construct their text properly. But I think we, we also just have to disassociate, turn it in from the concept of plagiarism, because the minute you say turn it in, students and everyone else, think of plagiarism and they become very terrified. So if, if we, can, we can change our perception about what is it and what it can do and let everybody else understand that, it can become a very useful tool. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think it's in the name, isn't it? Turn it in. And if you look at all the other ones, they even go so far as to call themselves, I'm going to go back to that first slide, they go so far as to call themselves plagiarism um, software. So despite, as I say, various court cases, they're obviously making enough money to warrant continuing. So, oh, there we go. Um, so turn it in. Really, it, 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 this is not a hard to develop academic voice software. 
this is a how to catch those terrible plagiarists software. Um, and it points to Tony's point about it. it, it profiting hugely from the fear of plagiarism. There's a question there about, you, is there any other tool? The only other tool is human, is, is, is humans. Artificial intelligence can't look for, um, not yet, <laughs> can't look for someone taking the ideas of others without recognition. But I would like to say, and I really want Amanda to speak a little bit more about this, but I would like to say that I think we are misplaced in our fear of plagiarism. I don't want to sound like I'm underestimating the importance of stewarding the disciplines from plagiarism and that plagiarism is a bad thing. I don't want to underestimate that. So I don't want anyone to misquote me on that. But I think that the focus on plagiarism is mainly because of, of universities' risk aversion of their reputation. And I also firmly believe that telling students, do not plagiarize, if you get caught for plagiarism, you will be punished, doesn't help them learn how to write academically. It makes them absolutely terrified. And it makes them think that their job is to try and hide any evidence of their getting ideas from elsewhere. Um, I think that if we spent, if, if I had my way, we wouldn't even introduce the word plagiarism until third year of university, but we would introduce a hell of a lot more effort in first year and second year at getting students to sit and understand how it is that knowledge is built in the academy, in their discipline, and to sit with journal articles in their discipline and to highlight where people are making claims and how they're using those references to support those claims. Because this is not a generic thing, it looks different in different disciplines. And to start to understand that the reason we reference is not to avoid plagiarism. There's probably a hundred reasons we reference, and I would argue that avoiding plagiarism is reason number 99 or 100. That the main reason we reference is to build evidence for the kinds of claims we want to make in our discipline. Um, and they need to see how we do that in our discipline. And that looks different in different disciplines. So referencing is not about open brackets, full stop date. It's not about Harvard or APA. Those are merely the traditions of different disciplines. Um, and there's a whole interesting thing about why different disciplines have different referencing styles. But but what, what students really need to come to grips with is why we reference. We reference because our perspective as an individual anecdotal human being is worth nothing in the academy. Our perspective is really worth, it's, it's, it's really, we can only form strong arguments if we can show how these have been based on prior knowledge, on empirical research, on established researchers. And so referencing is really about creating strong arguments. So students don't want to avoid referencing because their arguments worth nothing without references. And I think if we, if we approach it from that perspective, and as I say, go so far as to not even mention plagiarism, I would say that that's, obviously at some point we need to mention plagiarism and plagiarism is a terrible thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, if, if we're focusing on plagiarism, we are not teaching how, students how to reference um, and we're not giving them access. We're not giving them epistemological access to knowledge making. Um, and nowadays, so many universities make students sign a document to say, I think my own university does it as well, to say, oh, this is my own work. So now we're wanting them to, you know, make sure, we're kind of asking them to, I don't know, sign away their rights on top of a lack of support in learning how to reference. Anyway, I'm, I'm jabbering on. Amanda, do you want to add your perspective on that issue? Okay, I suppose I'm, I'm commenting on the question about whether there are other software besides turn it in. Yes, there's plenty of that. Some of them are free, unlike turn it in. They are on the web but I, I suppose they come with risks. Um, and if, if you read the literature by Weber Wolf, he's, he's written quite a lot about this type of software. He compared them in terms of their usability and other things. And you can, you can see from there which one is better and which one is commercialized or not. So yes, you can, you can actually have a choice but you have to be careful in terms of whether your, your text is safe with those other text matching software.
Oh, there's a really nice question um, um, from Shana Lee in about um, developmental views, um, and, and I think that that um, and Amanda's actually and I've published on that. But Amanda, I wonder if you could talk about that because there were one or two examples of developmental views, um, sort of educational approaches to writing rather than punitive, we'll catch you for plagiarizing and throw you out kind of approaches. Can I ask you to take that one? Yes. Thank you, Sue. Uh, th there are quite a number of ways that Turn It In can be used for, to develop student writing. And uh, one of them is, is to use it to, to help students to paraphrase without attaching any, without considering any score, just to teach them to, to construct without uh, considering any score. And there, there, there are other functions within Turn It In that, that can also help students to, to, to write and to construct sentences. So yes, if I, I remember one of the one one author used it, you know, the, the initial writing of students, he will use the, the turn it in software just for them to, to construct their text and, and the, the the tutors will be in charge of that. They will help students together with, uh, with the, the software to help them write properly without uh, uh, considering whether the similarity in the score is high or not. So I think there's quite a number of ways that you can actually use Tin It In to develop the student's writing. So the problem comes when now you are going to look at the similarity score alone. Yeah. And can I just add something there? Um... One of the things, because Amanda um, analyzed the plagiarism policies across all the universities. Well, the first thing is that we still call them plagiarism policies in this country, whereas most, uh, in many other countries have changed these to academic integrity policies, which come from a, a far broader understanding of, of, of the problem, not just plagiarism, but issues of contract cheating and so on, but also takes a more kind of what? positive approach. So it looks more at what does it mean to have academic integrity? What does it mean to behave in academically appropriate ways rather than kind of focusing on the negative? But, um, but uh, one of the things that Amanda's uh, analysis of these plagiarism policies in South Africa was that a couple of them did have what were so-called educational or developmental approaches. But in many cases, what that, what that came down to is that students would be given a workshop at the beginning of the year or part of um, academic orientation. And so the institution could say, look, we've, we've, we've done a developmental approach. We gave that workshop. But the workshop was hugely problematic in two ways. Firstly, it's usually generic. And actually, we reference in very different ways for very different reasons. I mean, in the natural sciences, all your references and your thesis are in your literature review chapter. In the humanities and social sciences, your references are in the introduction, the literature review, the methods, the findings. I mean, that's just one simple difference. Um, but there are multiple differences in the ways in which we reference um, in different disciplines, and we reference for different reasons. And so, so having a generic workshop at one sort of tick, the university's done its thing, um, really misunderstands the role of referencing and knowledge construction. And the other big problem is that those workshops were very sort of instrumentalist. They were around teaching the technical skills of referencing, which really has nothing to do with knowledge production. It's got to do with where you open your brackets and whether something's a capital letter or not. And quite frankly, nowadays with citation software, you don't even need to know that. You just need to know how to use the citation software and it'll do it for you. So there was this supposed developmental approaches which were ad on generic ad hoc workshops, which don't, we know, don't actually give students to the literacy practices. Um, I'm trying to think if there were any examples in your data, Amanda, of more more long-term integrated, meaningful development, education development approaches? Yes, so in one or two universities, and those were the traditional universities that uh, developed some manual in terms of uh, giving students some basis of uh, uh, academic writing, 
skills, you know, trying to, to, to link what they do in, the, in, the, in a subject or a discipline with how academic literacy work. And I also interviewed one of, um, one of, 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 of the people in this university and they explained that they, they actually, the support staff, they actually have a relationship. They collaborate with uh, the, the lecturers from different disciplines. And when they develop such kind of workshops, they develop them uh, according to, to the norms of the discipline as well, not just generic. I guess it also comes down to the whole notion of academic development, that, that if we are understanding referencing as really about taking on the literacy practices of the discipline, then it has to be a disciplinary expert who gives students access to that. Um, and, that's, and that's hard work, and it's slow work, and it's difficult work, and as um, I think it was, um, I think someone wrote a comment just now, about um, something being cheap, now I've lost it now, something being cheap rather than um, expensive. And, oh, there we go, Shanari. Um, and so, um, and also that it's just difficult. I mean, a lot of academics have taken on the disciplinary norms over time and they've become invisible to them. So it's really hard for the professor of, politics to spend time showing students why a reference is put here and not there. Why is the person used a direct quote instead of a paraphrase? Why is the why is this person had to had three references in brackets for this particular claim and only one there? Um, because by the time you become adept in the discipline, it becomes, it starts to feel common sense. And so I think for a lot of and that's where you get a lot of academics talking about English. And so they talk about this being about an English issue, assuming that English is the medium of instruction. So that it's seen as a language issue rather than a disciplinary norm issue. And so what happens then is you get these external people, other librarians or academic development people who come in and run kind of generic workshops, which I, I think help make students feel a bit scared and maybe learn one or two technical referencing skills, but generally make them feel scared that they're going to inadvertently get caught for plagiarism. Um, and, and I don't think it really gives them access to, to knowledge making. Um, in my experience of working with students, the fear of plagiarism is enormous. And I would say these are generally students who, um, they, you know, they're not intent on plagiarizing. They're terrified. Those students who are intent on plagiarizing um, are generally going to learn the skills to machinery. So that's the irony as well, is that stu if the machinery doesn't, the software is more likely, I would think, to catch inadvertent, unintentional plagiarists than intentional plagiarists. Because intentional plagiarists know that you've got to change some of the words. We even see techniques of using some letters in white. Um, you know, you white out certain letters so the software can't pick it up. Um, that the, the, the intentional plagiarists will do to make sure that the, that the software doesn't catch them. Um, and the truth is in South Africa, of course, it also runs down um, language lines. The first language speakers are far less likely to be caught. The kind of plagiarism that you can do if you're writing your mother tongue is not going to be picked up by a piece of software. Um, and so that's, that's very problematic. Amanda, can I ask you to take Nicola's question there? Because she's asking, what are the consequences of committing plagiarism? And I think that was quite interesting because it was very different in different universities. Yes, the, the penalties for plagiarism, they, they started from lenient ones, such as uh, maybe giving a student zero or giving, giving them a second chance to submit. 
some went to an extent of blacklisting the students. And uh, yeah, but most of the universities, they, they, they prefer failing the student in that particular course or even uh, uh, deregistering them for a particular term and then maybe they will come back later. Yeah. But more surprisingly, when I was um, interviewing some of the lecturers, some of the, the, the committee members who are also lecturers, they were telling me that in most cases, they, they don't even uh, report the plagiarism cases because they are totally in disagreement with the penalties that, that uh, the, the students have to take. So they, they, they preferred solving the problems between themselves and the, the students without the, the reporting to the authorities. Yeah, I think that, I mean, I mean, that has huge implications that if your academics see it as too onerous and punitive, um, that there's no space for them to have an educational um, response. Now, one or two of the policies spoke about the fact that if this was at a lower level and early, then the academics should resolve it themselves. So it allowed for that. It allowed for an educational response. But many are taking a so-called zero tolerance um, um, uh, position, which supposedly is a good one um, in terms of we have no plagiarism in our institution. We have a zero, zero tolerance view. But actually, that's against all the academic literature is... Um, you know, if we read one of the best books on plagiarism, by the way, I think, is um, Angelil Carter's book called Stolen Language. It's a small little book, and I'm sure it'll be available at every um, university library. It's a, it was, she wrote it, I think, when she was at UCT many years ago. Um, and in that book, um, she talks about the, the fact that early taking on the academic literacies of a particular discipline means that you need to. Um, plagiarize in the beginning. Um, and at the time, this was quite a provocative view. And now that text is used as, as a really um, central one by people working in the field. This idea that when you are a novice in a field, you kind of, um, you fake it till you make it. So you kind of um, pretending to have that voice that you're picking up in the, in the text that you're reading. Um, and it's not yet your, really your own voice. And, and she speaks about it as in sort of trying on other people's clothes. And when you try them on, you try and walk like they do and you try and strap the stuff like they do. Um, and so, and she, what did she call it? Patch, patch work, patch, patch writing. Patch writing, that's it. Mm -hmm. um, and she's certainly not condoning plagiarism. She's not saying that by the time you graduate, you should think it's okay to use other people's words and ideas and styles. But she's saying that patchwork writing, yes, that's it, yeah. Patchwork writing is actually a necessary step towards mm -hmm. becoming a confident academic writer. And so if we had a zero tolerance policy, then the poor little first year student who's trying ever so hard to sound like these accomplished academics that she's been reading is likely to be penalized. And, and on the other hand, this poor little first year student who's been to an um, orientation workshop that says, if you get caught plagiarizing, you'll get 0% or you'll get thrown out, might be so terrified to plagiarize that she doesn't take that necessary step of kind of trying on that voice. She doesn't try it out at all. Um, so fearful is she of being found to have used phrases that she's acquiring in her readings that she doesn't take them on at all. So um, uh, there's a rather ironic potential for students to be prevented from taking on a strong academic voice through fear of, of plagiarism. Um, yeah. <laughs> what is TRR? Oh, oh, Atlas TR? No. Kathy, what is, um, you've used TIA. Oh, turn it on. Oh, my hat. <laughs> Sorry, senior moment. Turn it on, yes. <laughs> yeah, so turn it on, I think, is so useful for helping students write and getting them to keep reading journals, getting them, you know, getting them to this idea that every time you read something, write notes for yourself. Don't try and write someone else first. Um, I think that's another very useful step to getting them to kind of start owning 
Yeah, and those are such such good advice because, as you've mentioned to us, um, with the students who are often um, found to be committing plagiarism are those who are second language uh, English students um, who perhaps also don't have those kinds of digital literacies for how to cheat the software, like you know, excluding your direct quotes or not, you know. Um, things like even trying out, you know, the whiting out of letters. <laughs> so that made me, you know, wonder: Are these tools uh, inherently biased, or do we do we attempt to help our second language English students get to behave more like those first language students and try different strategies, um, or do we help them do the patchwork better? I think we help them do the patchwork better because obviously the, the strategies that those first language speakers are using to cheat the system, those are, that's intentional plagiarism. That's really problematic. Other than of course, the excluding of the direct quotes, which I think is a good digital literacy that we should definitely make sure students know how to do. But all the other stuff is very intentional plagiarism. So we wouldn't want to um, even discuss it in a way. Well, maybe we discuss it, but, um, but I think that absolutely the software is inherently biased against first language speakers. Absolutely it is. I mean, I've been loath to, to harp on that aspect because I feel like that'll become a whole political debate on its own and it will stop us, us having a conversation about the misuse of Turnitin generally and the misunderstanding of the role of referencing and the responsibility of the academic generally. But, but I, I absolutely think that the software has to be biased against people who can't readily um, avoid it. And then, I mean, there are those other tools that, um, so second language students who perhaps aren't so good at English are starting to learn software tools that can give them not quite the benefits of the first language, but what are those tools called? Um, the ones that, so there, there's, 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 there's so much software now. There's software. Small seal tools. Yes. Tell us about those. Okay. Th these are kind of tools that, that students use to, to paraphrase. They just put in a chunk of text in, copied from somewhere and it rearranges and it, it substitutes uh, terms. And, but at the end of the day, the, 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 the writing don't make a lot of sense. Yeah. So, yeah I think this is what the, the, the second language speakers normally do because they, I think they become frustrated. I, I know I sit with, with a lot of students because I also use Tenet in, and they will come to me and say, but why, why is this recorded as plagiarism, whereas I've referenced? And then you can see that they've tried to, to paraphrase, but the system still picks it up as, as something that is not well paraphrased. So, so that is a challenge. So I think in a way, um, and, and that's a point Amanda made earlier, because we're making it such a punitive aspect of policing students for plagiarism as if, as if their plagiarism is always intentional as a mm. any form of plagiarism is bad, evil students trying to take a shortcut. Because that's how we're approaching plagiarism, we're using the software to do it. We shouldn't be at all surprised that the response is a software response, that it's, it's so e easy, exactly. You can just shift to um, F7, or you can just hit the thesaurus, you can, and now there's whole software programs that you can literally dump your assignment in, that you've cut and pasted from elsewhere, and it rejigs it a bit, and comes back to you. And, and yeah, but it's, as, as Amanda says, sometimes it it's a little odd, a little bit like Google Translate, but it's, um, it's getting more and more sophisticated. But I think that we are trying to, yeah, exactly, Nicola. Um, we're trying to, um, because we are approaching plagiarism in this instrumentalist policing way, we shouldn't be shocked when students' responses are manipulative and instrumentalist because it's kind of what we're encouraging them to do. We're not having these conversations about knowledge and meaning making and what counts in the discipline and why the discipline uses particular forms of referencing and how it uses it and why it doesn't reference for certain claims, but it does for others. We're not having those conversations. We're having conversations about if you get, if you plagiarize, we will catch you, we will throw you out. If that's how we have conversations with our students, then I think, you know, this kind of manipulation is, Quite frankly, the 
I mean, on another point is that I've often said, I've often represented students on plagiarism hearings. Um, and it, in a couple of the cases I've, I have claimed, and I'm thinking of one in particular, um, that the student is guilty of plagiarism um, and should plead guilty of plagiarism, but that the university needs to apologize to the student. Because unless we can, as a university, indicate how we have inducted the students into knowledge making, um, then I think there's a problem. And instead, what we have is universities saying, oh, but look, in February, there was a two-hour workshop on why you mustn't plagiarize. And the students signed this form to say that they didn't plagiarize. So, you know, we've, we've done what we need to do. Whereas actually what we have, what we should be doing is, um, is really inducting students. And I think most importantly is we need to, and this is the trickiest thing of all, we need to, where plagiarism is found, our first question needs to be, was it intentional or not? Because our response really should be quite different dependent on whether it's, and that's not an easy thing to judge. But, um, yeah, I think it's good. Yeah, the flip plus F7, I think it's also, well, I just wrap, you could just right click and hit thesaurus. And I think a lot of students spend a lot of time doing that, which is a nonsense waste of their time. Great. Thanks so much, both um, Sue and Amanda, for presenting for us today. Folks, if you've got any more questions, uh, please type in the, in the text chat. Um, even if you've got some advice, I imagine we have some colleagues with some good practices, perhaps at their institutions, or if you want to share, uh, would like to share your experiences. Um, I know we have uh, someone, we were doing a pilot uh, with using Grammarly, and while it's not necessarily plagiarism, uh, you know, Grammarly sold as a kind of academic writing tool, I guess, in a way that is similar to how Turnitin is seen as this plagiarism, as you say, you know, they say they're not the plagiarism detection tool, but they actually are. Anyway, so Grammarly um, doesn't read the discipline, uh, disciplinary ways of writing. So we had a science student who had to write a report in the third person. And Grammarly came back and wanted to, the, the results came back and wanted her to rewrite in the first person. Um, so she mailed us and she said, you know, what, what's going on here? Uh, so that was very interesting. So we kind of can't always take the feedback uh, that we get from these tools. Um, you know, can't take it at you know, at first glance, we've kind of got to look further. Uh, so is this is something it seems that you are suggesting that students uh, and lecturers do it do. So things like the with the similarity report. Um, yeah, I think Grammarly, I mean, Grammarly works pretty well for many social science-y kind of subjects. But I think it once again shows you it's not about grammar and it's not about plagiarism. I mean, they're both in the name kind of thing. It's about taking on the academic practice of the discipline and look, that's a long and hard process. Um, I, I really like Grammarly, but then I think I'm, I'm confident enough in my writing to tell it to buzz off when it gives me a suggestion <laughs> that isn't leading me in the direction I want, I want to go, but it's really good for picking up sort of everyday errors or run-on sentences and so on. I guess, um, I guess the main thing is firstly that if ever you see a colleague calling for a percentage on a similarity index, we need to put a stop to it. Um, 
that's really very important. And I think it's becoming a, a, it's becoming a real problem in South Africa. We're going to find ourselves in, in a, a real fix if we go that route. But it's also just that if we go, you know, the other main point I think that we're trying to make is that getting learn, teaching students how to write is, is a long and complicated process. Um, and and it takes lots and lots of opportunities for students to, it's a social practice and like all social practices, it's firstly, it's social. So it's not common sense or just language or it's, it's about becoming part of that social group, whether it's phys physics or chemistry or philosophy. And it's a practice, which means that it takes lots of practice. So I'm trying to get to the slide at the end. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, if you have a look at that slide, which has got um, the um, publications that Amanda and I have, have got out there, that first link actually takes you to a short video. It's about six or seven minutes long, which goes through a lot of the things that we've said today, um, sort of misunderstandings of Turnitin. So, um, yeah, I think, I think you might find that's a useful thing to be able to send to colleagues or to send to your students. Okay, it's three minutes to three. Uh, doesn't look like we have any more questions. I think folks are really, um, uh, you know, it was very, very engaging. So thank you both. 